first first up is my friend here in Austin, Ismail Madni. So Ismail, please join me on the stage. So Ismail has been doing pricing in-house. He's done pricing for Log Me In. Uh, he worked at Auth. He's, uh, he did pricing for InVision. And currently, he's the head of product and pricing strategy for Okta. So this guy has seen a lot. He's built a lot of pricing functions. So he's going to talk about pricing for customer value and growth. You know, how do you how do you establish the pricing functions? We all want to get most value from our products, uh, but have to weigh in in market pricing and other factors. There's a lot that goes on there. All right. Good morning, everyone. I hope everyone can hear me clearly and loudly. Let me know if you can. Great. Thank you for uh, that wonderful uh, presentation or you know, introduction. Uh, I'm very lucky to be here today. Very excited. We have a great group, not just myself, but speakers after me are folks I've learned from. Uh, I've uh, taken advantage of their knowledge as well and applied it to in-house companies. Pep, I do agree with you as well with uh, the weather here. I know winter is coming. We badly need winter. It's been a hot summer here in Austin. Uh, so let's uh, go ahead and get started. Uh, my session is really on pricing for customer value and growth. What I'm going to do is take you through essentially my framework in-house that I use to come up with pricing, to come up with packaging, to make sure we're doing the right things for our users and our customers. We can go to the next slide. So let me just tell you a little bit about myself first. Uh, my name is Ismail. Again, I'm here in Austin. I grew up in DC. I lived in Raleigh. I had the chance to build three strategic pricing functions. It seems that my niche is uh, strategic pricing hire number one. I built one out at Okta recently. I was at Envision prior, and I was a part of the build at the Citrix Go 2 products before the merger. Some of the cool products I've gotten to work on have been GoToMeeting, GoToWebinar, LastPass, that was a great project where this framework really worked well. Envision, I got to work with the team at Coda a few years ago before their launch. That was really exciting. Clearbit uh, in 2019 and Grain, which is an excellent uh, user research tool. So just thinking about today, what this session is about and why we're all here and why everyone is here in general. This is a challenging topic, but one of the most interesting and exciting and one that uh, I'm just very happy my career has lent me towards. Again, how do you price a product? That's, that's a critical question that everyone is trying to answer. Pricing is such a key lever that if you get it right, you're going to drive your business. You're going to build brand equity with uh, proper pricing, and you really set yourself up for success. What is the right package? This is critical. What are you actually offering your users? What are you offering your customers? There is a methodology behind determining that right package. And how can pricing and package drive expansion and upsells? This, to me, is uh, one of the more interesting challenges. If you look at how Wall Street looks at public SaaS companies, for example, they want to see 120% NDR, which is net dollar retention. That comes off of driving upsells. If you sell a customer $100 worth of product in year one, investors want to see that customer be at $120 in year two. So let's get into it a little bit here. One of the key things I like to talk about is a random price point versus strategic pricing. I know many of us have not been able to travel the last year and a half. I've only been on one flight, and that was about two months ago uh, since uh, February 2020. However, before that point, I used to travel uh, about 30 to 35 times a year. I'd get on an airplane. So about two to three times a month, roughly. I had TSA pre-check, of course. I wanted to bypass all the waiting. I didn't want to have to take off my shoes or you know, empty my pockets, et cetera. So I purchased it for $85 uh, over the course of five years. My mother, who traveled once a year at best, also purchased TSA pre-check a few years back, $85 over the course of five years. We we're both paying the same price even though I used it more and I got more value out of it than she did. 
Let's think about the airlines and how they do strategic pricing. When you think about traveling anywhere, you get on an airplane, it takes you from point A to point B. That's essentially what it is. You're getting in a big tube with other folks. However, someone in first class could be paying almost four times as much as someone in basic. What do they get? They get to sit up front, a slightly wider seat on the plane, and maybe a warm meal. But effectively, they're doing the same thing as someone in basic, getting from point A to point B. Yet, they're willing to pay four times as much. This is strategic pricing right here. This is pricing and packaging to its core. A segmented offering to your customers that solves their needs, that is at a price they're willing to pay. And the airlines have really mastered it. Let's take a look at a SaaS example as well. So this is something that uh, I got to work on, as I mentioned before, was uh, grains pricing before their launch. Uh, I worked with a phenomenal team over there. And this is what we came up with as they were launching. So let's look at some of the elements that the grain team included in their pricing. Number one is segmentation. This is absolutely critical. It's something that Kyle and Patrick talk about quite a bit in anything you read uh, in their documentation. This is the absolute foundation to great pricing. Uh, as you can see with grain, there are three plans. However, they're segmented to different types of users. The free user who might be just kind of trying it out, taking it for a spin. The professional user clearly needs a little more than a free user but the professional user isn't a business per se. And then that business user, that power user, the person or the team that is constantly doing customer research, that constantly needs reporting. So thinking about segmentation first and having that as the foundation of how you set your pricing is critical. The second thing is the value metric. This is extremely important getting it right. If you get it wrong, uh, you're not going to align your customer's usage, your customer's uh, you know, value with customer growth as well. You won't be able to upsell or expand the account. In the case of Grain, the value metric is how many creators per month are using the product. Uh, in the free plan, it's obviously free. In the pro plan, it's $15 per creator per month. And in the business plan, it's $36 per creator per month. How do they pay for it? Per creator. The more creators they have in the product, the more they're going to pay for it. So getting that right is uh, absolutely imperative. And then finally, the value driver. So this is a little different from the value metric, which is what you charge on and what the user pays for. The value driver is really what gets users to either upgrade in plans, as in this case, or gets them to purchase a particular plan. But this really helps in providing that benefit in your offering. In the case of Grain, our research, and we'll get into some of the research in a minute, but our research indicated that the value driver was how many recordings per month per creator. So you look at the free plan. It includes three recordings per person per month. At the fourth recording, if you need one, you have to jump into the pro plan. The pro plan includes 15 recordings per creator per month. If, uh, you need, if you're having a big month with uh, quite a bit of research, you need to bump into that business plan, which includes unlimited recordings. This is for the power business users. This value driver, again, helps drive those upgrades and actually provides something to the uh, user. So how do we get there? Uh, you know, is it based on what our competitors are doing? No. Is it based on the cost to the business? No. Customers don't care about costs uh, to your business. They care about the value they're getting out of it. The way you get to understanding price and having pricing like that is to ask your customers. And it sounds pretty basic, but there is a framework. There is a methodology behind this. So let's get into some of that here. I'm going to keep it high level today because each of these topics themselves could be an hour long session. So I want to just make sure to give folks on this call a flavor 
This is a flavor of what I've done in the past, and some of this I used with grain, with LastPass, with Coda. But essentially, I start with uh, two areas here. One is the qualitative interviews. This might be my favorite part. You know, surveys used to be, but as I got better and better and more comfortable doing interviews, I started to really enjoy these interviews quite a bit. Get a small sample size of 10 to 15 potential customers or potential prospects. It's all you need to get some themes out of that. It really gives you the why behind the numbers. It allows you to get to know the users. Get into that a little bit more in a moment. The other aspect is the uh, quantitative surveys. Larger sample sizes allows you to see big trends. Make sure that you are getting a representative sample of your customers. And there are three analyses that I always recommend and that I always do in internal pricing projects. The Max Diff analysis, the Van Westendorp, and the Conjoint. These are all inputs into developing your pricing strategy. So let's go back to interviews again. Uh, as I mentioned, this is now my favorite part of coming up with pricing and pricing strategy. And it really is about getting to know your customer. I don't ask very many pricing questions in these interviews. I really want to get an understanding of your day-to-day -day activities. What are you doing throughout the day? Who are you working with? Where do you sit in the organization? Uh, what are the problems you have, uh, either with collaboration? Again, in the case of Grain, what we discovered was, hey, it is very difficult for me to get recordings of user interviews and easily share them. If I do them in any other app, uh, it takes some time. I have to do some editing. I have to record it. There. So really understanding the person uh, behind some of the numbers that you'll see later. Again, how does any of these particular features we have benefit you? Again, in the grain, for example, it's very easy to share your interviews or little snippets of the interviews. So I really wanted to get an understanding of how, how does a particular feature benefit them. And then I get into a few pricing questions along the lines of what gives you the most value. Are you saving time with the solution we may have? Does it save you costs? Are you able to collaborate better with your team? I really want to dig into what what is truly going, what is our product truly going to help them accomplish? One of these three are, are great places to start. These are some great sample questions. There are many more online and I actually have a link to the Grain blog uh, where I, I discuss some more in detail. But uh, the interviews, again, are some of the most interesting aspects of this because you really do get to know the customer and it helps you design better service. Now, getting to the surveys themselves. The first aspect of the surveys that I like to do is run a max diff analysis. I typically want to get about 500 responses to these that are actionable. 300 is good enough. I aim for 500. Uh, you can get lists. You can send them out to your customer list. This is a real easy example of what are important different features when selecting a movie to attend. Again, does it have a major star? Did they win an Oscar? Is it on the historical fiction? It's just a real generic example here. You can think about uh, an example like Zoom. Uh, if they were running a max diff, they may ask questions along what's the most important, the number of participants, how many minutes, uh, the quality, you know, do you need 4K or 5K quality? Uh, do you need some sort of security like password? And again, what you're really trying to figure out is what is most important and least important so that you can start to tailor the value driver, understanding what, what is it that, they, that really they're going to choose when customers and prospects are forced to make trade-offs. It really is all about forcing those trade-offs. The next analysis that we'll do, the next survey, this is generally what I do is a set of two surveys uh, with the Max Diff and the Van Westendorp in one, and then the conjoint in the final one, but the Van Westendorp. Again, this is not something that I say is going to give you the exact price. I know there's debates around this. My personal philosophy on this is it gives you a range of acceptable prices. And it's based on four pretty basic questions. Let's say, again, you were considering a video conferencing platform like Zoom, you would ask questions along the lines that, 
at what price do you think this is so cheap that you question its quality, that it's not even worth the money? You know, it's just that inexpensive. At what price do you think this product is a bargain? Uh, which again allows, all right, now it's it's on the cheaper end, but I'm willing to buy it. There's there's some quality there. At what price do, do you think it seems expensive? It's starting to seem expensive. You know, you're th the respondent is thinking, okay, you know, fifteen dollars a month for this. Eh, you know, I can I can pay that. That's fine. I'd rather pay twelve, but fifteen's fine. You know, getting expensive part. And then what price do you think it's too expensive? The respondents will put these into the survey and you'll be able to get a range here uh, of acceptable prices, which you can see on this chart. This chart is the output of it. Uh, again, what this allows you to do is say, all right, between, again, for example, video conferencing software, between the prices of $2 and $15 per month per user, that's an acceptable range to price our product. We don't want to price it at $25. We don't want to price it at $30. That's too high. $1 is too cheap. It just gives you that range that allows you to do further experimentation. Finally, I take those inputs from the Max Stiff, from the Van Westendorf. It helps me create some packages that I believe will resonate with our customers and really narrow them down. And this is when we run the conjoint really allows you to drive that optimal package composition and price level uh, for those particular packages. So again, this example here is internet and cable packages. This is a fairly simple conjoint. Again, we could spend three days on conjoints, but I wanna just give you a high level flavor of different packages, different options, and you'd simply have the respondent pick one. Again, there's a slight difference in all of them, either a change in price or installation is not included. Uh, what is your internet speed? There's always one or two variables that are a little different. The output will allow you to see what really is that value driver. Uh, we did one, a very large one while at Envision, and the outcome that demonstrated you know, what the value driver was were the number of documents and the number of documents you could share. Uh, at Envision. So the output of this is very powerful. And again, this is another example of uh, you know something that we can expand on quite a bit, but this is what I want to give a flavor of here today. In summary today, I know this has been short, but I wanted to keep it very concise in the framework I have. We're trying to answer the following question. And this is what I'll present to leadership. This is what I'll present to my internal stakeholders in product, in PMM, in sales, even in finance. So folks in the company understand what we're doing. What are our customer segments? In every offering, there are customer segments. Not all customers are the same, whether it's airlines, whether it is user research, whether it is video conferencing, whether it's a security product, there are different customer segments. You must identify them. That is the foundation. So once you have segmented your customer base, it becomes much easier to develop an offering that fits their needs at a price they're willing to pay. What is the value metric that aligns to customer value? Absolutely critical. If you get that value metric right, it'll help drive growth because it aligns with how customers are using the product and what how they're how their usage uh, works. So you definitely want to make sure you get that value metric right. And what features provide the most value to our customers? Again, think about it, not from a just, hey, we need this feature, but what is the value? What is the benefit customers are getting? In the case of Grain, again, one of the value drivers was the number of recordings they're able to do and then subsequently share. Uh, hence how we created that value driver. And how do you get there? Again, do some customer interviews and surveys to go ahead and come up with your pricing and packaging that aligns to those uh, customer segments. What I showed you today between the interviews and the surveys, depending on the company, it takes about eight to 10 weeks, everything I showed you to do, to get a set of interviews, to look at that uh, information, to synthesize it and then create real good surveys and then come back again and come up with options. It takes almost a quarter uh, to do that end to end. Uh, but this is the framework I use and this is the process. I'll be happy to answer any questions now uh, and 
you know, happy to uh, provide this to folks as well. Thank you so much. Uh, question number one. Where do you get the panelists? So like if you want to survey 300, 500, whatever number of people, like uh, where do you get them from? That's a great question and it's a challenge. Uh, I'll be I'll be honest, I've had good experience with some panels and not so great experience with other panels. Uh, what I try and do is at least internally, we should have a house list, as we call it, of either folks in your nurture tracks or folks who have signed up for any type of content from you. That's one area I get panels from. But you also want those folks who've never heard of you. So there are panel providers. Uh, I know yeah, you, you've been working on this as well. I've had mixed results with third-party panel providers, to be honest. There, there are many, many of them out there, but in the B2B context, it's still not great. Yeah, I hear you, man. That's that's why we're building our own panel at winter. Uh, about sample sizes, so Yarmo is asking, um, uh, sample sizes for one Western DARP and conjoint analysis, like how many people do you need there? Yeah, no, um, great questions there. I work with, uh, believe it or not, one person who taught me quite a bit was a PhD in research. She now works at um, Pendo, I believe. I, I don't remember which company she's at now. 300 is good enough, is what she told me. And 500 is optimal. Uh, and this applies to the conjoint. This is in quantitative studies. That it allows you to eliminate outliers. It allows you to eliminate people, you know, quite frankly, BS some of the answers. So in that 300 to 500 range gives you enough to clean the data and you still have enough actionable insights and it provides it down by the segment level as well. Mm -hmm. I guess the thing is like with the more sample size, you're just, your margin of error is getting, you know, lower and lower. Exactly. With one Westendorf, the literature says that the minimum sample size that's already, you know, usable is 50 people. And obviously 500 is yeah. like, your margin of error is like plus minus 1% with 50 people, you know, it might be 10%. Yeah, and, and I think with 50, you'll see some really interesting results that intuitively don't make sense. For example, I once had a Van Westendorp go out and we didn't have a great sample. Uh, we only had about 120 respondents that we felt were actionable. And that acceptable range, when you actually did the math and plotted it all out, was something like $4 to $50 which was which we knew was way too wide and sometimes yeah that's where the interviews come in you already have a sense of okay this doesn't make sense to us we something is off here right uh louise is asking here that where can you find case studies or or more information about these different frameworks and, and uh, analysis techniques like uh, conjoint yeah, there are some uh, great uh, resources here that I'll provide. One website that I think is phenomenal, there's a company called Sawtooth. They create uh, Conjoint and MaxDiff software. They have terrific literature, absolutely great literature. They have a conference every year that it becomes quite academic. So sawtooth.com is a great resource. In the pricing context, actually, Patrick Campbell's blog really helped me get started about a decade ago, Price Intelligently. He has incredible content through all of this uh, in terms of how to apply the Max Diff analysis and how to apply a Van Westendorp analysis in much deeper detail than I gave today. So I highly recommend you look at his blog at Price Intelligently. Mm -hmm. Also, let's, let's talk about selection bias. So Louise is asking like, what if the people that you survey, they're not actual decision makers, let's say it's B2B pricing. So does that, is that, that a problem or no? A, that is a, a challenge. I don't think it is a problem, especially with us shifting into much more of a product led growth, uh, a cycle for lack of a better term. I really focus more and more now on users less on decision makers than I used to, because ultimately if I get users and I've provided an offering and an experience that solves their needs, that solves their problems, they will get the decision makers to buy in. This is no longer, we're no longer in that top down world. And I know Kyle will get into this a lot more today, but software purchasing decisions in B2B context in particular is no longer top down. It is user driven. So I now optimize more for the user. It's great to have decision makers, 
But even then, through interviews and through what I've seen, uh, just based on experience and talking with customers, they love a product. They will get their organization to get on board. And I'll give you one example here was, again, three years ago, four years ago when I joined Envision, it's probably at the top of where it was, but design team started to slowly use Figma for free. They love the experience of Figma. They then started convincing their decision makers, hey, you know what? We have to get on Figma even if we may not be getting as good of a deal with it. So I now optimize for end users. Awesome. Uh, well, Ismail, it was a pleasure. Thank you for sharing your knowledge with us. Thank you. I really appreciate it. And again, the rest of the sessions today are going to be amazing. I'm really happy I was here today. Thank you, man.